Our next speaker is Kirsten Tillish. Um, Kirsten is an associate professor of medicine in our division at UCLA, co-director of Neuroimaging Core, Gail and Gerald Oppenheimer Center for Neurobiology of Stress, and the chief of integrative medicine at the Greater Los Angeles VA. She has a clinical interest in chronic pain and functional GI disorders and is a member of the Rome Committee for Central Disorders of Gastrointestinal Pain. Her research interests include brain-gut microbiome interactions, the effects of complementary and alternative medicine interventions such as meditation, probiotics, and herbal therapy on health and disease, and the treatment of functional GI disorders. And she'll be discussing today the cyclical vomiting syndrome. Thank you. So just listening to my, my bio, and thank you for the nice bio, um, the talk I'm giving today on cyclic vomiting syndrome is a talk that was initially going to be given by Dr. Emin Mayer, who is at the American Psychosomatic Medicine meeting um, receiving a, an award. Um, so I, I, I'm filling in. And uh, this is a disorder that I actually really enjoy treating and find satisfying treating. but. Um, my interest in integrative medicine is not really reflected here because there is so little research in this area. And maybe I'll just throw in some comments as I speak um, from slides that he provided me. Uh, so I give him credit for, for many of these slides. The most important thing, I think, about cyclic vomiting syndrome is just that we are talking about it and that we're recognizing that it exists. Um, this is a disorder that when we catch it uh, early is really very easy to diagnose, sometimes challenging to treat. Um, but if we miss it, it has incredible impact on the patients and really starts a whole snowballing um, of illness that, that make the patients uh, really develop a great deal of distress and, and become more difficult to treat as time goes on. So, so really, the, the, the first slide is the most important. We think about it, and we don't forget about it. We actually just missed International Cyclic Vomiting Awareness Day, which was March 5th, um, but really, we should remember it all year round. I'm going to start with a, a patient that I saw a number of years ago um, who was sort of this, a simple case. So this was an 18-year-old college student. He presented initially with an episode of repeated severe emesis. He woke up early in the morning. He started vomiting profusely over and over and over. He'd never had anything like this. He had just gone to college. He had, just, he had not been someone who drank alcohol or smoked marijuana in the past. He went to college. He went to some big parties. He overdid it. And this happened, and his impression was, wow, I really kind of overdid that, and this is why this happened. He had another episode a few months later that was not associated with binge drinking or a big party. It was during his finals week or midterms week, I forget. He was pulling all-nighters. He wasn't sleeping well. He was eating poorly. He was having some stress. He ended up in the emergency room. He required fluids, antiemetics. Again, he just sort of thought, ah, college is stressful, and this is something that's happened. But throughout his freshman year, this continued to happen, and he had five episodes. Each lasted 12 hours at the shortest, up to a couple days, progressively worse, occurring usually uh, very early in the morning, often waking him up, uh, and with less clear triggers. Each time when these more severe episodes occurred, he was seen in the emergency room, he was given fluids, he was given antiemetics, sometimes pain medicine, because he started to develop some pretty bad upper abdominal pain. And he had follow-up in student health, which was really treating yet another acute incident rather than seeing these as, as a whole. After the fourth episode, his parents said, you know, this is going on too far. He saw a local university physician who thought maybe he has Crohn's disease. Uh, he had a workup for Crohn's disease that was fairly extensive. And nothing was found. His labs looked great. He looked great. When he saw the doctor, he was feeling great. Everything was fine. Um, and, and, and so they said, oh, no, you don't have Crohn's disease. 
The impression uh, after the negative workup was by his doctor in conversation with his family members that maybe he was having too much stress, school, stressing out, he was worrying, maybe he was partying too much. Um, and in talking to him, he, you know, so I saw him at the end of his school year when he came back home to Los Angeles. He didn't feel excessively stressed. I mean, school was, it was a tough year. He hadn't felt well, but he was really liking school. Um, he was challenged by it, but he was pretty anxious about these episodes and how it was going to affect his grades. It had caused some problems for him already. Um, he had stopped drinking alcohol other than a beer here and there after the first episode. He didn't think he was partying excessively. He was still smoking marijuana on a <clears throat> fairly regular basis, which he had never done in the past. Um, but, and his parents were starting to be a little suspicious. And so this is the exact time where it's so important to find this diagnosis and make this diagnosis, I saw him after the year. So I had the advantage of looking at this whole spectrum of the year. Acute episodes of intense vomiting and abdominal pain leading to the need for rehydration, completely fine in between. Clear triggers, marijuana use, poor sleep, stress. Um, and, uh, and a patient who presents to me looking completely well without uh, any pre-existing psychopathology, without a history of uh, drug abuse or, or other things that, that concerned me. And it was very clear that he had cyclic vomiting syndrome. If we don't make this diagnosis and we continue to treat him as having these repeated single episodes, he ends up on potentially opiates for his pain. He ends up being looked at as a drug seeker by the emergency room. He ends up with his parents being suspicious and what's going on with him. There's, he's, he's hiding things from us. He ends up incredibly anxious, potentially dropping out of school. You start to build uh, a really negative cycle. So, so this patient, which, who was a very easy patient to treat, he did well on therapy, he stopped smoking marijuana, he, um, he, he did very well is really the, the joy of treating a patient like this, where you can talk to them for a very short period of time, be very confident with your diagnosis, uh, and treat them successfully. It's not always that simple, um, but, but this is really the, the key. So the Rome criteria has a, diagnose, a diagnostic criteria for cyclic vomiting syndrome that really is based on these stereotypic episodes of acute, recurrent, uh, short-term vomiting episodes. Patients usually have uh, three or more episodes a year. There's an absence of nausea and vomiting between episodes, though in some of the more complicated patients and patients who are diagnosed after a long period, I have seen patients who develop some more intermittent or uh, more chronic nausea in the interim periods. In an absence of metabolic gastrointestinal or central nervous system uh, diseases. There are some supportive clinical features, particularly a family history of migraine is very common. There's an unusual uh, feature where patients get relief by having hot showers or baths, and this has been reported multiple times. And the first time I read this, I, was, I remembered a patient that I had seen as a uh, house staff or maybe as a, even as a fellow where the you know, we took, I took the history, and it sounded so bizarre to me. It was a nurse, a male nurse who had come from Vegas, and he had these episodes that were terrible, and he would leave work and take a break, get home, take a really hot, hot shower, and it would abort an episode, and then he would go back to work. And I, just, I thought he was a little bit nuts. And I was seeing this patient with someone who actually did not recognize the disorder at the time, and I sort of, months later, reading about cyclic vomiting syndrome realized that this was a classic presentation that we had, we had missed. Um, comorbidity with anxiety, depression, attention deficit disorder, and functional GI disorders is common. It's an uncommon disorder, <clears throat> but we all see it at some point in our careers. There doesn't appear to be a major sex difference, so some studies show a few more women, some of the kids' studies show a few more boys, um, but in general, men and women have it. Uh, it affects all races. Uh, age of onset in kids is in the age range of three to seven most commonly, in adults in the late 20s, early 30s. And episode frequency can really range quite a bit. Some people having many, many episodes through the year, but an average around four. ER visits are very common.
And one of our big goals is to try to avoid those. The social and economic costs are pretty huge. Uh, in, in some studies, uh, 30 to 50 percent report losing their jobs, as you can imagine, if you constantly have to go out of work for unexplained reasons for days at a time. Uh, it's very hard to keep a job. At the time of diagnosis, many patients are on disability. Over half of the employed patients miss a significant number of days of work. And many patients feel stigmatized or misunderstood by their physicians and family members or co colleagues and friends. It's a, it's a kind of mystifying disorder for many people, and they're often thought to be fakers, drug addicts, uh, a number of things. So we have to be really uh, careful about how we um, speak to the patients um, and also communicate with the emergency room physicians when we're caring for patients who have CDS. So what causes it? There's some thought that mitochondrial dysfunction may be one of the factors. Um, this appears to be more commonly um, or more robustly associated in the childhood disorder. There are um, some gene uh, abnormalities in the mitochondrial DNA that have been associated with CVS in kids, though these have not really held up in adults. So, well, one thought was that it was a corticotropin releasing factor dysregulation with CRF being the hormone that causes our cascade of stress responses that has a circadian rhythm that fits the common pattern of CVS where most patients do have symptoms that come on in the early morning, uh, very early morning, um, but it's not clear. Um, we do know that there's a considerable overlap with psychological symptoms and psychiatric disorders and stress-related uh, trigger of symptoms, and so there certainly is some central brain-gut uh, activity that's going on. Um, interestingly, this is one of the disorders that you see that positive stressors seem to be as salient to developing symptoms as negative stressors. So um, I've had several patients preparing for their wedding. It's a good stress, but it's a stress. Uh, I've had a patient miss her honeymoon because of an episode um, in kids' birthday parties. So anything that gets them sort of excited, whether it's positive or negative, can be a stressor. There's a characteristic stereotypical se sequence. Most patients know when it's coming. They have a prodrome. They start to feel funny, sort of like you might with a migraine. Um, they can develop lethargy, pallor, anorexia, perspiration, the nausea comes on, pain can come on in this early, early period that can last uh, for minutes. And this is often our tri we try to target for therapy to abort the full-blown episode. And then when the episode occurs, they go off vomiting and, and uh, that can continue uh, unabated for, for long periods of time. At that point, they can uh, be tachycardic. They can... Uh, look incredibly ill, uh, and this is when they end up in the emergency room, sometimes with severe pain, requiring pain medication. And then they have a prolonged recovery. They're wiped out by these episodes. So it's really disruptive. The GI symptoms, so vomiting, obviously, being uh, the salient one, but abdominal pain, very common, and sometimes can even overpower the vomiting in some patients, be the most prominent symptoms. They have nausea, they have recurrent retching, Diarrhea and constipation, so bowel habit abnormality, is really not that big of a feature. Systemic symptoms, they look sick uh, when they show up. Between episodes, uh, they don't. The triggers are numerous and very individual, and they can be difficult sometimes to tease out. Someone who gets an infection, that may be a physical stressor and trigger, psychological triggers I mentioned. Some people identify dietary triggers, so similar to migraines, things like wine, chocolate, cheeses. Um, menses are a trigger for, for many women. Uh, motion sickness or anything that makes them feel nauseated may be a trigger. Exhaustion is a big one, so poor sleep. It's a really commonly misdiagnosis. The delay in diagnosis, when you look at different studies, ranges hugely from a year to eight years, very commonly missed as patients bought between one and another doctor. And so this is an area where um, working with our colleagues in primary care is really important so that they get to us uh, with a, a diagnosis. And it's something that I, makes me very pleased at UCLA. There's a lot of education in this area where I get a referral that says, I think this person has cyclic vomiting syndrome. Can you just check it out? 
uh, and that's really how it should be early on. Certainly they get these acute episodes. People say it's food poisoning, it's uh, binge drinking, it's viral gastroenteritis, and it's difficult to know on a first episode, uh, but it's the recurrent follow-up that's key. Um, they can be told they have gastroparesis, they can be told they have, they can be accused of substance abuse uh, and drug seeking. How do we identify it? By these recurrent episodes, this normal intervening period, episodes that are very stereotypic, so they may be different from one patient to another, but for that patient, they tend to be the same. So not everyone has these 4 a.m. Uh, episodes. Uh, I had one patient who, if he slept late, he never had the episode. So if he could sleep in to 9.30 or 10, he was fine. But when he moved his work shift, he was a cook, so he went from dinners to breakfast and lunches, it completely threw him off. And when he had to get up early in the morning, he started having these episodes every couple months. So something that is very specific to that person, but stereotypic. Absence of other findings, so we do need to do a workup. This is somewhat a diagnosis of exclusion in, in many adults. Um, they do appear ill when you see them during an episode. They often will have a personal or family history of migraine, uh, and the vomiting is really, really intense. So in terms of a diagnostic evaluation in adults with suspected cyclic vomiting, we do want to rule out uh, a structural disorder. So someone could have an intermittent obstruction that causes this type of vomiting. Usually when you catch them in the middle of that, you would see some evidence of that on a plain film uh, or some type of imaging. But often these patients uh, are going to end up with an endoscopy. Um, we don't want to miss a central disorder, so a tumor, brain tumor. And in some cases, it's appropriate to do uh, brain imaging. Uh, obviously, we want to rule out pregnancy uh, and, and, and toxins. The great majority of the patients we see as gastroenterologists have already been in the emergency room multiple times and have had a lot of these tests already, just not in an organized fashion like we would hope. So our general approach in between episodes is prophylaxis. So we want to prevent the episodes. Once they happen, they're very hard to stop. We do that ident identification of triggers is a key thing. Marijuana is a trigger for many, many patients, though not all. And I usually just ask people while we're trying to get the illness under control, whether they believe it's a trigger or not, just to stop it. Um, and if we get their symptoms under control, if they want to test out whether it, it's uh, a problem, then, then they can. And that can sometimes be tough um, in, some, in some patients. Um, amitriptyline is really a cornerstone of prophylaxis and works very well in many patients who tolerate it. The doses that I use for cyclic vomiting are higher than I usually use for IBS. So I'll usually start a, a low dose but very rapidly try to get them up to close to 50 milligrams and see how they do. Cyprohepatidine, propranolol, anti-migraine medicines are also used as next line therapies. Acid suppression can be helpful in some patients who have prominent GERD because it just decreases the sensitivity uh, of the gut, but is not something that I add in people who don't have underlying GERD symptoms. Certainly support is important, recognition that they're not alone with this disorder. There is a good uh, support association. And because this has such a prominent impact on their function, uh, and because it can trigger significant anxiety and even panic, I often recommend that they uh, work with a behavioral therapist to reduce symptoms. Um, and I've had some patients do really, really well with hypnotherapy, gut-directed hypnotherapy, to help them learn how to bring down their stress levels uh, when they think they might have an episode and stop the cycle of anxiety, producing stress, producing lack of sleep, producing a symptom flare. During acute episodes, we want to try to abort them as quickly as possible. So using benzodiazepines, so sublingual um, clonazepam uh, and, and sublingual adansetron at home, just get it in the system, see if it can st stop it early. Uh, if it doesn't, they may need to go to the emergency room, they need, may need fluids, keeping them quiet and supportive. Try to avoid using opiates if possible, though some patients have such severe pain uh, when they're in the emergency room, they, they do require them. Um, and this just graphically showing the 
way that we intervene at, uh, at different areas uh, uh, to avoid and prevent episodes, to abort episodes in the prodrome, to treat those episodes when they're happening, uh, and then uh, maintain them during recovery. So in summary, adult cyclic vomiting has a distinctive stereotypical temporal pattern. Uh, it can be very easy to diagnose in the typical cases. I think we'll hear about a case a little later that is not so typical. And when it gets mixed up with multiple other disorders, it can be tricky. So cyclic vomiting that's overlapping for example, with irritable bowel syndrome or another functional GI syndrome or a severe mental illness can be very challenging. Um, but making the diagnosis is really the important part. Um, we know that it has a major impact on health-related quality of life, on people's employment, on their personal life. Uh, and we need to address that at the same time we're treating the medical disorder. After organic diseases are ruled out, the majority of patients do respond to prophylactic therapy and over time are able to get the frequency of their, their episodes to, to extend and, uh, and even go years without episodes. Children uh, often grow out of it. Adults, we're less likely to grow out of things, but uh, patients can stop the cycle uh, and, and go for years without symptoms. Um, we have to recognize this as a brain gut disorder. Uh, with significant overlap with other disorders like migraine, like psychiatric diagnoses. We need to treat it within the context of those diagnoses and often work synergistically with their neurologist if they have severe migraines, uh, with their psychiatrist or psychologist if they have uh, mental health concerns so that we can maximize um, their medical treatment from a GI standpoint. Um, and when we do this, uh, like I said, these can be very, very satisfying patients uh, to treat when they do well. And I'd like to thank you for your attention.